All right. <clears throat> Thanks everyone for the opportunity to give this presentation again. We had some technical difficulties at the workshop, which is where this was originally supposed to be presented. So now we have an on-demand version. My name is Cameron Chevalier. My advisor is Alex Greeny, and we are working out of UC Riverside. This is our progress update on Syria. Syria is a promising material for, in particular, high temperature infrared transparent windows. And we want to determine primarily the thermal expansion and the intrinsic thermal conductivity of Syria, because these are key factors that are related to shock resistance in this material, and that's going to be relevant for the type of application that we would ultimately want to use it in. Ideally, in the future, we would also like to understand structure property relations that influence this thing called the multiphonon adsorption edge which is essentially a, a process of IR adsorption where a material is able to absorb many phonons of energy across a series of anharmonically coupled phonon modes. The figure at the bottom is a portion of the infrared spectrum, and we are interested in the three to five micron range for applications and the red oval is just to, to highlight that. So we want to predict thermal properties in these materials. Now we can predict thermal properties of perfect crystals, but these things are centered. They have to be processed. They're never going to be perfect. Lattice thermal conductivity is always an upper bound with perfect crystals. So if you want to be able to predict thermal conductivity, you've got to be able to predict the theoretical upper bound from first principles and then how that upper bound is suppressed by extrinsic effects. So in this case, in this system, we have a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic factors with extrinsic effects primarily coming from defects. Now, ultimately we want to model a real world system which contains defects and includes quantum mechanical dynamics what we can actually accomplish is model through quantum mechanical dynamics, the quantum mechanical effects, or alternatively, we can model perfect systems and imperfect systems with non-quantum mechanical dynamics and approximate forces. So we have to use the limited tools we have to bridge the gap between these two worlds. And then we have to determine what the error associated with doing that is. So the main point of this is that later on, we're gonna show a number of comparisons of the results obtained from using an empirical potential. In our case, this will be the Buckingham potential. And we need that to be able to simulate defects and other imperfections in Syria. We're going to compare that with DFT calculations. We have to compare in particular the third order phonon calculations to determine how accurate the empirical potential is for this system. Comparing the quantum mechanical calculations of thermal conductivity with the empirical potentials to the same thermal conductivity calculations carried out using molecular dynamics in the future will ultimately tell us the effect of quantum mechanical occupancy, uh, how much of an effect that has on the thermal conductivity itself. So with the model kind of laid out, we can begin talking about results. So to obtain our results, we first had to make sure that our calculations are converged in the same way that you always have to when you do DFT calculations. So this would be making sure that you have convergence with the number of K points used in the Brillouin zone integration, or for example, the plane wave energy cutoff that is also used. When it comes to doing phonon calculations, there's an additional consideration, which is what we're doing is computing the stiffness for the interaction between 
how one atom, when it moves, exerts a force on the other atoms in its vicinity. And because we have periodic boundary conditions, when you displace some given atom, really you're displacing a series of its periodic images as well. So you have to make sure that your computational cell is sufficiently large so that those periodic atoms aren't self-interacting with each other. And we don't know from the jump how big the cell needs to be to prevent this from happening. So we've performed our calculations using increasingly larger supercells until we recovered a consistent band structure. So what that might look like is shown here. So on the left, we have a phonon dispersion plot of a 4x4x4 four by four by four supercell that we obtained from DFT, which is the uh, red series, and the Buckingham empirical potential, which is shown in blue. On this plot, NAC stands for non-analytical correction, which is a Born charge correction. So what does that mean? Basically, in Syria, there's charge transfer between the cerium and the oxygen, and that induces dipole formation, which in turn generates an electric field that interacts with other dipoles. So the dipole-dipole interactions in this system strongly influences frequencies of the optical branches near the gamma point. And you can see that the DFT obtained dispersion doesn't experience the same large frequency dip that the empirical potential does. But we know from experiment that the dispersion profile in this region should still be relatively flat. And we can fix this by running our simulations with non-analytical correction, which is shown on the right-hand side for the same system. Now, DFT gives us, in this case, the expected profile but the Buckingham potential still exhibits the same dip in its upper mode, albeit to a lesser extent. So that raises the question of what's going on here. Well, when you look closely at this, you find that the empirical potential only has two tuning parameters in it, and they're fit to give the best lattice parameter. The potential's curvature at equilibrium is what sets the stiffness, it's what sets the dispersion relation that you see on this slide. So with only two parameters, you end up with a potential that's too stiff to accurately describe dispersion for Syria. The interatomic potential is formulated with a functional form, and it's supposed to replicate or represent the physics of how atoms interact. So the idea is that you're not over-parameterizing them because their shape should be based on the physics of these interactions. So what we think is missing when it comes to the empirical potentials is how the atoms are polarizable, and as a result, they can distort. So specifically, a cerium ion can distort or polarize the oxygen's electron cloud. And we can verify against experiment very briefly, which is shown here, that the flat profile that we obtained from DFT is consistent with experiment. But again, our empirical potential still sees a dip that is not repeated elsewhere. So we know that there's still work to be done when it comes to the empirical potentials and estimating the error that's associated with that. Now, to get a better idea of which atoms are moving at different frequencies, we've also plotted the phonon projected density of state, uh, density of states for both DFT and the empirical potential. And the projected density of states shows us which atoms are mostly responsible for the different observed modes. So as you might expect, the higher frequency modes are due to the movement of oxygen, while at low frequencies, everything is moving. And this is plotted in mass-weighted units, but it contains similar information to what we saw in the dispersion. We just know that oxygen is doing most of the movement at high frequencies. Now, what does that actually look like? Well, what we see here is that the top of the mode 
excuse me, the top mode is just oxygens moving in opposite directions. So that's what you see in this box up here, while the cerium ion itself remains stationary. So that gives us no infrared activity. In the middle mode, the oxygens move in the same direction while the cerium moves slightly in the opposite direction. And that's what induces a polarization that gives us IR activity. For similar reasons, the acoustic mode is non-IR active, and we can compute the IR activity itself, which is what we've done on this slide. It's shown in the bottom left figure in the intensity versus frequency plot. Uh, we've shown here, this is Syria against zinc sulfide. Uh, zinc sulfide, in this case, is the zinc blend polymorph, so it has a cubic crystal structure. And what matters here is the height and the peak of the intensity frequency plot itself for both of these uh, compounds. And what we see is that Sirius peak resides at a lower frequency than zinc blends, which for single photon absorption means that Syria should be the stronger performer. Now, when you get to third order and higher calculations, because everything up to this point can be calculated with second order interactions, um, the math now becomes more expensive because now you have to account for additional forces that arise from the additional atoms involved in the interaction. So by third order calculation, what we're doing is when you move one atom and we move another atom, how are the forces on those atoms, which are exerted on them by both each other and the atoms that surround them, different from if we just moved each of those atoms together and then calculated the forces. So we have to basically do many more moves and you have to make the accuracy that's associated with these calculations uh, a lot higher to be able to actually com converge this kind of simulation. So for example, our simulations use displacement distances of about 0 0.03 angstrom. And this sometimes might not be sufficient to overcome the effects of numerical noise, in which case you would need to use a larger displacement, but then that has the drawback of involving higher order anharmonicity in the force constant calculations. So it can become very complicated with how you handle this. And you have the additional consideration in that case of how far out do we have to go when considering these additional higher order interactions? You have to use a range cutoff. So in our case, our simulations use second, third, and fourth nearest neighbor interactions. And when it comes to these higher order interactions, it becomes intractable to use four by four by four supercells and, and higher. So what we've done is use three by three by three supercells, which technically aren't quite converged in the dispersion, but they are very close. So these results are for three by three by three supercells uh, that are very close to convergence. Now, what we found is that predicted thermal conductivities are much lower for DFT, and they seem to be still in rough agreement with measured values of the thermal conductivity for Syria. The plot on the right here was actually prepared using a two by two by two supercell, which we know does not have a fully converged dispersion relation. So our results are likely uh, a bit more accurate in this case, and we should be comparing to higher resolution data in the future. But what's perhaps more interesting is the way in which these converge don't seem to be the same for DFT and the empirical potential, which tells us that perhaps the physics of, of what's going on, the anharmonicity is different between these two different models, which is something that we'll wanna be looking at more closely as we continue work on this project. Lastly, 
we've done simulations to compute the cumulative conductivity of the four by four by four, excuse me, the three by three by three Sirius supercell that we obtained from DFT. Now, cumulative thermal conductivity is an accumulation function of lattice thermal conductivity here with respect to the phonon mean free path. And it's a useful single crystal property that allows us to get some insight into how much microstructure or nanostructure can potentially reduce thermal conductivity. So the conductivity plot here is for the three by three by three DFT supercell. And we've included it for temperatures from 300 to 2000 Kelvin. And what this plot is really showing us is that if we, let's say, know that the material that you're working with has some defects in it, but you only know that the average spacing of the defects is some predetermined quantity that you've worked out, then what this tells you, well, let's say that the defects are roughly nanometer scale spacing. So in that case, we would know things probably above about 10 to the minus eight meters are going to get truncated. So we might be cutting off information and we can make an estimate of how much the thermal conductivity would be reduced in that case. So in other words, once you have the cumulative conductivity, you don't necessarily have to do a lot more complicated calculations, which from a materials design point of view, this enables us to start delivering more useful information quickly, just based on knowing this. So we use it essentially as a guide when we scale our simulations. So lastly, just to conclude here, we are still wanting to work out theoretically the anharmonic theory and determine what terms dominate those higher order interactions. We're still looking at the multi-phone on edge because that's one of our ultimate goals. And we want to take what we've learned so far and apply that to more complicated system that uh, systems that have both defects and that can handle dopants. So thank you once again for the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, I'm hoping my microphone was able to hold itself together this time. If anyone has questions, I'm sure we'll have meetings in the future and I'm also available by email. So thank you for your time.